Nations. As many of you know, the United Nations Charter was signed just across the hall in the Hertz Theater in 1945. And it was an exultant time. We were bringing a close to World War II. There was still a battle raging on the Pacific. But uh, the military and all of the world leaders had gathered here to forever eliminate the scourge of war. And we remember all of those uh, incredible people and all those who died so that we might create an international organization uh, to preserve our peace and security and our human rights. Uh, how many of you know that uh, the League of Nations was formed in 1920 as an outcome of World War I, and it was an organization that uh, was intended to end the war, the war forever, and it was a universal membership organization. It had uh, fewer members, and it had a different security council, a different leadership. Good evening. Um, Thank you all for being here. Thank you for having me. Um, so I was going to talk mostly about human rights, but let me say a couple of introductory things first. I think one of the things that's happening in international law generally and the, and the uh, UN system more specifically is a kind of convergence of issues. And so issue areas and parts of the UN that don't necessarily have human rights in their name, for instance, are now dealing with human rights issues. And parts of the UN that have, for example, sustainable development in their name are now dealing with human rights issues. And parts of the UN that are dealing with trade issues are now dealing with human rights at the same time. So we're starting to see that there are a couple of overarching themes in the entire UN system, uh, and they are tending to come together. Uh, and I would say that at least for me, human rights is one of them, and probably environment or sustainable development is another. Uh, so I wanted to talk first about um, the big picture of all of the different parts of the UN that deal with human rights, and then talk a little bit about the parts of the UN that have human rights in their name. Uh, they're not necessarily the same thing. Um, and then I wanted to end with a couple of sort of caveats or thoughts about where we go from here. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. So, big picture. The UN Charter has two articles that talk about human rights, but they don't say much about them. They don't tell you what human rights are. And basically what they say is that all states that are members of the UN should um, promote and protect human rights. But it wasn't until the UN created a commission on human rights, headed by Eleanor Roosevelt, that um, we got the first uh, universal human rights instrument in the UN period, and that was the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And the Universal Declaration of Human Rights covers a wide range of rights. It covers what we in the US talk about as civil rights, uh, as political rights, but it also covers economic rights, uh, the right to social security, the right to health, uh, the right to a um, decent standard of living, uh, which includes food, shelter, uh, and other things, the right to education. Um, and so it's a very broad instrument. Now, it's not a treaty because the idea was that if you made it a treaty, you'd have a big fight uh, about which states became part of it and which states didn't. And rather, what we talk about is a common standard of achievement for all states. And so that's what the Universal Declaration is. Uh, after that, there was a spree of treaty making, starting with what we talk about as um, the International Bill of Rights, so the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the International Covenant on 
economic, social, and cultural rights. And then a series of specialized treaties, there's now nine of them, uh, including treaties on women, children, migrant rights, um, prohibiting torture, prohibiting discrimination, prohibiting forced disappearance, um, and a lot of declarations, resolutions, principles, uh, guidance, documents, all kinds of things that set out in great detail uh, lots of specifics about how human rights are to be carried out uh, at the national level. Um, but so what do we do with all this? Right, so that then has been the question of the last few years. Uh, there is still some uh, standard setting going on in the UN, but not as much as there used to be because the idea is what we really need is to take the standards that we have and make them operable and make them work and make states actually um, comply with them. Right? And so that's been the work of the last few years, trying to get states um, not only to not violate human rights, but also to um, fulfill and promote. So both to not violate, but also to make sure that private parties, for instance, don't violate its rights. Um, now, how has this been carried out? Well, big picture, all parts of the UN have been involved. So just a couple of ideas of things that have happened. Uh, we started with the Commission on Human Rights. The Commission on Human Rights, after a long time operating, uh, was subject to a lot of criticism for a couple of reasons, some of which were unique to the commission and some of which go on today. One of the critiques was, oh, this is way too politicized. Um, you know, s small nations that don't have a lot of friends get dumped on, and strong nations that have a lot of friends somehow manage not to. And so the thought was we need to have something that will be more impartial. Um, there was also a problem that the commission didn't have its own sort of independent status under the General Assembly. It was kind of down in the hierarchy. And so the idea was, no, we need something that shows that, the human, that, that human rights are actually taken seriously in the UN. And so starting in the mid-2000s, the commission disappears, and what you get is the Human Rights Council, which is what we have now. And I'll talk in a minute about what the council does and, and sort of how it does it. But besides the council, there have been an increasing number of different um, mechanisms that have been put in place to try to deal with human rights. One is the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, which is also fairly recent. Uh, the current High Commissioner is Michelle Bachelet from Chile, former president of Chile, former head of UN Women. Uh, what does the High Commissioner do? Well, she's basically the uh, alarm bell and ombudsperson, right? kind of a combination of the two. So she, her job is to raise alarms about places where human rights are in danger uh, and try and find out what's going on and try and negotiate with states to uh, get rid of at least some of the worst kinds. Um, and she also has a function of sort of looking over um, what states are doing, maintaining state reporting, and overseeing the UN bureaucracy um, with respect to human rights that is basically uh, in Geneva. Um, in addition, there are a lot of the specialized agencies that you saw up here, even if their name has nothing to do with human rights, they often have a human rights aspect to them. Uh, for example, the ILO, the International Labor Organization, UN Women, UNICEF. Uh, there's now a forum on indigenous issues, for instance, under the UN. There's a forum on business and human rights under the UN. There's a crossover to sustainable development through one of the sustainable development goals that was put in place a few years ago. Uh, the Sustainable Development Goal number 16 is about rule of law, peace, uh, and accountability. And so you're getting this kind of diffusion through the human rights, uh, sorry, through the UN machinery, even when the name doesn't say anything about 
human rights. It still will take up uh, human rights issues. Um, the Security Council, so as we saw up there, uh, the Security Council is the uh, organ that is supposed to deal with peace and security in the UN system. Uh, and it's the only way that you can legally, under the UN Charter, um, initiate military activity without the consent of the state. So the Security Council for years and years had nothing to do with human rights. They, they shied away from it. They ducked it, basically. Um, and it was only with the couple of things. One was the fight against apartheid in South Africa. Um, one was the creation, the, the wars in the Balkans and then in Rwanda, which I think um, my colleague will talk about, uh, that gave rise to international criminal tribunals. Um, the Security Council now uh, regularly gets involved, um, but also has real, uh, real problems. Uh, most of those problems are due to the veto. Most of those problems are due to the inability to take action whenever one of the permanent five members vetoes. So what's been interesting about this is there have been a series of efforts to kind of do a workaround uh, around the Security Council. For example, the General Assembly created an independent mechanism on Syria that does not go through the Security Council, because of course the Security Council, because of a Russian veto, um, wouldn't do anything about Syria. And so we now have an independent mechanism yet, um, that is collecting evidence of war crimes in Syria that bypassed the Security Council. Uh, the Human Rights Council is doing a similar sort of thing uh, with independent mechanisms in other parts of the world. And so the Security Council is important, but it's also stymied so often that there is now a lot of creative thought going into, well, if this doesn't work, what do we do? Right? Do we um, you know, sort of create mechanisms that go outside the Security Council? Um, let me talk briefly in the couple minutes I have left about the, the uh, Human Rights Council. So the UN human rights machinery basically has uh, two pieces to it. Um, some depend on a treaty and only apply when this, when this relevant state is a party to the treaty. And those treaties are the ones I talked about. Each of them has a reporting mechanism. Each of them has an expert committee that meets regularly to consider how states are doing in their um, you know, sort of as far as putting into practice the treaty. Um, the other sort of um, side of the human rights machinery is the Human Rights Council. The Human Rights Council is a bunch of diplomats. It's a bunch of politicians. It's, you know, and it has all of the advantages and disadvantages of any group of politicians that you put in a row. Um, with some extra complicating factors because they're all from different countries and speak different languages, etc. Right? But the thing is, um, they can create resolutions, they can call out countries for massive violations of human rights, but they're subject to all the politics that you might expect. What they have done because of that is create a set of mechanisms that don't depend on the politics, that are made up of experts, that are made up of independent people who can go and look into what's happening in the country or around a certain issue, so-called special rapporteurs or independent experts. And there are now over 40 of these. Uh, and they, depend, they, they have to do with different issues um, on torture, on forced disappearance, but also on extreme poverty, on human rights and the environment, uh, on human rights and uh, the international economic system, etc. Um, there is also, and this is an innovation, and here I think I'm going to end, um, there are a couple of innovative things that are going on. One is these commissions of inquiry that I talked about. Another that started a few years ago um, is something called universal periodic review. And the idea was that 
You know, if you thought the old Human Rights Commission was politicized, in part it was because it picked on the little guys. And so the way you avoid picking on the little guys is you make everybody have to go through a process of review. And you make it periodic, as the name suggests, and you create a situation of kind of peer review where states are looking at what other states do with input from the UN system and from civil society groups. And so this is now the third or fourth round of uh, universal periodic review. Um, not clear to me yet how effective it's been in making states overall change their behavior. So if you're a human rights violating state, it's not like you're not going to be one, but you are going to change specific things in response to um, suggestions made through universal uh, periodic review. So this is a change. Um, let me end by saying um, there are periodic calls for reform of the UN human rights system. Um, a lot of the reports, both in the treaty system and otherwise, take a long time. States are really late. They don't do what they're supposed to do. Um, there's been a lot of talk about maybe we should make the system littler and more demanding. Right? But then states that are sort of marginal would have no accountability at all in the UN system. Right? And so that's why it doesn't happen. Uh, there's a big review coming up next year of this system. Uh, and what will be interesting will be to see what civil society groups propose as ways of further strengthening um, the UN human rights system. So I'll leave it there and I look forward to your questions. Um, finally, I'm thrilled that um, the professor was able to find time to speak to us. We've been corresponding for some time. We have a last minute change. You may notice a difference in uh, the flyer that we sent out to you. But we're really fortunate to have uh, Sun Kim. Uh, Sun Kim is sitting, uh, standing in for Nina Minialani, uh, who uh, had other considerations this evening. He'll be joining us in the future. She is the staff attorney at the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals in San Francisco from 2010 to 2015. She was an associate legal officer at the United Nations International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, it's called ICTY, acronyms abound with the UN organization, in The Hague, where she worked in chambers on the case of the prosecutor V. Radovan Karabic. You've heard about that. Previously, Sun worked at the extraordinary chambers in the courts of Cambodia the Kimmer Rouge Tribunal, and the European Center for Constitutional Human Rights. Her expertise include litigating international crimes, genocide crimes against humanity, and war crimes, international humanitarian law, and human rights law. She was an adjunct professor for two years at the University of San Francisco School of Law, where she taught international human rights law. Sun is an advisory board member for the International Courts and Tribunals Interest Group of the American Society of International Law and a member of the International Criminal Justice Expert Advisory Group for the American Bar Association. We're very glad to have you with us. Uh, Sun Kim, would you elucidate? <laughs> She was in this committee trying to draft the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, 
And this is her quote on the meaning of what is human rights. And she said, where after all do universal human rights begin? In small places close to home, so close and so small that they cannot be seen on any maps of the world. Yet, they are the world of the individual person, the neighborhood he lives in, the school or college he attends, the factory, the farm, or the office where he works. Such are the places where every man, woman, and child seeks equal justice, equal opportunity, and equal dignity without discrimination. Unless these rights have meaning there, they have little meaning anywhere. Without concerted citizen action to uphold these rights close to home, we shall look in vain for progress in the larger world. So when we're talking about human rights, international human rights law examines the role of the state or the obligation of the state. And when I say state, I mean nation state. So the obligation of the state to its nationals or its citizens or peoples in its territory. We're, we're looking at what has the state done to respect, to protect, and to fulfill these human rights of people living in um, the nation state's border. And on the other hand, what has the state done to violate the human rights? And I, I come from the international criminal law and the international humanitarian law aspect of um, this kind of general overview of justice, but I'd like to just pose a question for the audience to think about throughout tonight about what does justice mean? Because justice means different things for different people and different communities. So sometimes justice means a legal process. Sometimes justice can mean truth and reconciliation. Sometimes justice can mean establishing a historical record. And what you think is justice might not be justice for the community or the people you're trying to serve. And so when we're talking about justice and the human rights um, mechanisms of the United Nations or international criminal law, we need to keep in mind what does that mean and are we actually fulfilling the justice that victims want. And so with human rights, we start with um, if we have kind of large scale mass atrocities in human rights, they often rise to the level of what we call international crimes. And uh, one of the, I think, kind of greatest achievements coming out of the Nuremberg and Tokyo tribunals was the United Nations setting up what are called ad hoc tribunals. And so if we go back in history, um, after World War II, the tribunal, uh, the trials in Nuremberg and the trials in Tokyo were set up, and these are the precursors to the modern international courts. And they were mandated with adjudicating war crimes, crimes against the peace, and crimes against humanity. And remember, this was before the creation of the United Nations, before the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And so, this kind of modern international criminal law, we think, sort of lay a bit dormant until the 1990s. And in that way, um, the Security Council really stepped in in two major world events. One was the war in the Balkans, so the dissolution of the former Yugoslavia, and the other one was the genocide in Rwanda. And the UN response to this, and it, it has been criticized that this was the Security Council political response to atrocities being committed in a time of war, was to set up an uh, international criminal tribunal. Um, so the first is the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, the ICTY, where, um, as Mary said, I worked for uh, more than five years on a trial. <laughs> And in fact, the trial took more than five years. It's shocking to many people. And we can talk about why these trials take so long. Um, this was the first war crimes court created by the United Nations um, after Nuremberg and Tokyo. And it was established by the UN Security Council under its Chapter 7 powers. And it was established in 1993, and it closed its doors in 2017. Lasted quite a long time. And I think the Security Council had no idea what um, these ad hoc tribunals would become. Kind of like they created this Frankenstein and let it go into the world. And it became, you know, the ICTY is now thought of as sort of the white shoe um, kind of international criminal tribunal. So the ICTY it adjudicated war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide committed during the conflict in the Balkans in the 
As I said, I work on the heritage case. Um, so Radovan Karadzic was the president of the Bosnian Serbs, and Bosnia was a multi-ethnic country, multi-religious country, and during the dissolution of the former Yugoslavia and wars breaking out, came to the former Yugoslavia, there was a lot of um, ethnic uh, cleansing, ethnic separation, ultimately uh, genocide in Trebrenica against the Bosnian Muslims. This was a very important leadership case because Radovan Karadzic was the president of the Bosnian Serbs, and by virtue of that office, he was also the commander-in-chief of the armed forces. So that's why it's called the leadership case. And the ICTY was very important in establishing this principle that just because you're the head of state or the head of the armed forces does not mean you're immune from international prosecution if you commit international crimes. Um, the trial lasted from 2009 until 2014, and the judgment was delivered in 2016. Heritage was found guilty of genocide in Srebrenica, guilty of crimes against humanity and violation of the laws and customs of war. He was sentenced to 40 years in prison, and his case is currently on appeal. Actually, he appealed it. So what is the legacy of a tribunal like the Yugoslavia Tribunal? It delivered judgments in, again, high-profile leadership cases. It established precedent on genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity. It established an undisputable historical record of what happened in the Balkans during that time. And it worked very closely with national and local courts and um, judiciaries and authorities to just continue some of that accountability, but at, at the national level, so domestic prosecutions. The next court um, is the International Criminal Tribunal for, the, for Rwanda, the ICTR. Um, this was created in 1995, and it was um, seated in Tanzania, in Arusha. Its mandate was to prosecute persons responsible for the genocide committed in Rwanda in 1994 and for serious violations of international humanitarian law. What is the legacy of the ICTY? It is now closed. Um, it was actually the first international tribunal to deliver verdicts in relation to genocide and to interpret the definition of genocide from the 1948 it was also the first international tribunal to define the crime of rape in international criminal law and to recognize rape as a means of perpetuating genocide. So that's quite important for um, sexual and gender-based violence. The other courts that have been established that have UN support, um, the first is what I call the ECCC, the Extraordinary Chambers of the Courts of Cambodia, where I worked in the pretrial chamber. Um, that dealt with crimes committed during the Khmer Rouge, Rouge period, which was which ended in 1979, but it was established in the late 90s, and it took that long because Cambodia was um, in the middle of a civil war post Khmer Rouge for a government to come into Cambodia and basically ask the United Nations to give it assistance to set up a court. The interesting thing about the um, C is that it's a Cambodian court just has international assistance. So what that means is, let's say we have a trial chamber of five judges, there's always a majority of Cambodian judges or Cambodian staff with international support. And so um, it follows Cambodian um, criminal law and procedure, which is based on the French um, civil law system because the French um, were there. Um, but it was really interesting to work there because you had a lot of interaction with your national counterparts. There's a few other courts I'd like to mention, and then I'll just close with the International Criminal Court. So there's a court that was established in Sierra Leone, the Special Court for Sierra Leone, if you remember Charles Taylor. Um, um, so this is a hybrid international criminal tribunal, and that was also the government of Sierra Leone requested the UN to um, assist them to set up a special court. And the latest one is called the Special Tribunal for Lebanon, and this is seated in the Hague as well, near the Hague. Um, and it is just a tribunal of, quote, international character. And the mandate is very limited. It's um, to hold trials for people accused of conducting the February 2005 attack in Beirut, which killed former Prime Minister Rafik Hariri and 22 other people. So that's it. I think 
the political aspect of Lebanon trying to hold such a, a trial within country was too political because I think the accused are alleged members of Hezbollah. Mm -hmm. um, the Lebanese government requested UN assistance and they set up this court in the Hague, near the Hague. And this is the first tribunal to deal with the crime of international terrorism. An interesting thing about this tribunal is that because it's based on Lebanese criminal law and procedure, it allows what's called trials in absentia. So the trials have been conducted and they've been going on, but the defendants are not physically present. If the defendants are ever caught and extradited to the STL, they will hold the trials de novo again. And that's very, very weird for us as common law attorneys to have a trial in absentia, but it is allowed under a certain civil law system. So I will close with the International Criminal Court, and just to make a note that um, a lot of people, there's just so many acronyms and tribunals and courts, and it's really easy to get them confused, and there's the International Court of Justice, which I didn't really talk about, and that deals with state-to-state -state disputes, so if one state thinks that another state violated the terms of the treaty, you can take those states to court at the International Court of Justice. So I'm talking about international criminal law, which is individual responsibility. Um, so the future of international criminal law is at the International Criminal Court. This is not a UN body, and it's not a UN organ, and it's not really affiliated with the UN, but it is the world's permanent international criminal court. So this is not part of the UN system, it's totally separate. It's also based in The Hague, so that's why it's confusing, because all of these um, tribunals are based in The Hague, but it is treaty-based. So states have signed up to the Rome Statute, which is the statute that formed the court, and said, I give my jurisdiction to the International Criminal Court. So like with any treaty, the state has to sign on, and it's a voluntary process. It has jurisdiction to prosecute individuals who commit genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and the crime of aggression. And even though it's not part of the UN system, the UN can play a role in the International Criminal Court, and how it does that is the UN Security Council can refer what are called situations that turn into investigations and maybe cases. The UN Security Council can refer a situation to the International Criminal Court, and the Security Council has done that twice in its history. The first in 2005 for the, the genocide, the situation in Darfur, and then in 2011 for Libya. Um, but I would just like to say that there are um, many non-members of the International Criminal Court, big players in international diplomacy, including the US, China, Russia, India, Israel, North Korea, DPRK, Iran, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, there have been states that have withdrawn from the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court, Burundi, the Philippines. So it's not a perfect system, and there is a lot of, um, I think, criticism that these big countries, US, China, Russia, don't join the International Criminal Court, and we can discuss that, of course. But um, in closing, I would just like to say that in the long history of the United Nations, just ensuring accountability and justice. Like I said before, justice can take many, many forms, and I've only discussed one form, which is legal processes, um, but it's, it's imperative for us to think about what does justice mean for different communities, and is the legal process really the appropriate way to ensure justice? Thank you. Okay, so what I am going to talk about is peacekeeping and field missions, the UN has just uh, changed the language and the acronyms that I'm used to. So DPKO is now the Department of Peace Operations, and DPA is now the DPPA. And that's UN acronym for the field missions. And it sounds like the peacekeeping department just does military peacekeeping while uh, political is something that doesn't involve force or soldiers. That's not true. Uh, a lot of times what would happen is uh, DPKO would be very, very busy with some interventions, for example, Afghanistan. So when the Iraq uh, mission was set up, that was under DPA because <coughs> They had people in New York who 
didn't want to put all the missions under DPKO, so they put some under DPA. When I was there my second time in Afghanistan, the Yunama mission was switched from, for example, uh, DPKO to DPA because DPA had now in the 2016 not enough missions, and so we were switched back and forth. So it's somewhat of a flexible sort of system. Uh, and everyone will have a test, so I'm not sure we have you know, this. Mary already cut it. Uh, look, the Secretariat, that's where everyone wants to work. I was a staff member for almost 20 years. I never got to headquarters. Uh, and why is this moving without me touching it? Okay, let's go back. Uh, but a lot of people like to work, live and work in the nice places. Jim, sorry, uh, can you help me? Because this thing is moving. I think we have poltergeist in your computer. Um, so, until we just stop it from doing that. So what we have is New York as the main secretariat. Uh, that's where, uh, obviously, the General Assembly is and where the UN headquarters are, including the Secretary General. You have Geneva, which has a number of very important functions. Obviously, Human Rights is located in Geneva, along with quite a few other agencies, funds, and programs. Uh, and it's very popular. Both New York and Geneva, by the way, uh, they actually have something like a 100% increase in salary if you work there because it's quite expensive to live in those places. <laughs> they should do the same thing in San Francisco. I don't think they do. Um, the third, uh, if you will, part of the Secretariat is in Vienna. And that's where you have agencies, including the uh, UN's atomic energy inspectors who are dealing with uh, the so-called weapons of mass destruction that were never found in Iraq, as, long, as well as with quite a few others. Uh, along with them, you have the UN Office of Drugs and Crime working out of there. And my favorite, being a Star Trek fan, this is real, the UN Office for Outer Space. I cannot tell you how many times I applied to work there <laughs> in this intern, uh, and I never got the job. Uh, Fourth is Nairobi. Nairobi is also uh, has uh, secretary of functions, uh, but it also has quite a few of the agencies, funds, and programs. So, uh, and I just said those sort of things. The Security Council, obviously, there is great concern, as you heard from one of the previous speakers, because obviously any one of the five permanent members can veto. And those of you who are, do not have gray in your hair uh, may think, why is the permanent council those five members? Because those five members won World War II. So therefore, they put themselves as the permanent members. And there's obviously uh, one of the big issues is shouldn't two continents that are missing, as well as other countries such as Germany and Japan uh, be part of that. And uh, I'm kind of pessimistic on that issue. I'm really here to talk about peacekeeping because that's where my experience was because I was in the field. Started with Bosnia and Kosovo, um, then going to Afghanistan, uh, then to South Sudan, then to Solomon Islands, that really wasn't UN, but it was based upon the same model that the Australians led because of a civil war in, uh, in what you might know as Guadalcanal, part of the Solomon Islands, and there were about 300 civilians killed, and thus uh, some war crimes certainly not of the magnitude as you have in uh, most of the other places, and then back to Afghanistan. So, what I wanted to talk about is, first of all, the Security Council's role. It has resolutions that are binding. The five permanent members have the right to veto. 
Binding means theoretically all member states must comply with the resolutions. That doesn't always happen because the member states sometimes argue, well, you didn't really mean this or that, and besides, we don't like it. Unfortunately, the US, with its belief in exceptionalism, uh, is one of those uh, that unfortunately sometimes uh, does a lot of evil. Uh, the Security Council has authorized the use of force to maintain and restore international peace quite a few times. I'm going to go through the history later on of peacekeeping, but I did want to point out that it's really important when you are in a mission as to what the resolution authorizing your peacekeeping or peacebuilding mission says. Why? Because first of all, that's your mandate which means when the Secretary General's Special Representative, so Special Representative Secretary General of SRSG, who is in effect the ruler of that mission, uh, he or she uh, can basically steer it and run it however that person would like to, uh, along, as long as they follow the mandate and the priorities that are put in. And I will quote one of our SRSGs who was making a joke once and said, well, I wonder what the resolution will say this time. We all know it's like a Christmas tree, unfortunately. A Christmas tree with a lot of ornaments because it has so many things that we're supposed to do and take care of. And at the same time, we don't have the resources to actually do all those things. So I am forced as the SRSG to choose among the priorities to prioritize the prioritization, and that's why he was referring to that. So there's a lot of discretion within the mission to work within a resolution, and one of the things that we do in a mission, or we did, is that we provide suggested language to New York that will then be used in the draft resolution for Afghanistan every year in March we would get the new resolution. The resolutions are usually good for one year, and then the uh, Security Council decides whether or not to continue a peacekeeping or peacebuilding mission or not, and a mission is ended as well as established, as well as modified by that Security Council resolution. So it's very, very important. And here, uh, again, none of you can read this, but that sort of is what it looks like. And I guess we'll talk with uh, Mary, our president, to see those of you who are interested might be able to get a PDF of some of these so you can actually read it. Uh, I wanted to use uh, UN Security Council Resolution 2405, that's how they, they're all numbered, uh, which lays out the priorities and authority of, Afga of the Afghanistan mission to give you an idea of how it works. So, paragraph six said that UNAMA and its SRSG should lead and coordinate the international civil affairs and focus on the following priorities. And then it lists the priorities. Support the peace process. Support the organization of future Afghan elections. Promote a more coherent support by international donors to the Afghan government's priorities. There was so much money flowing in to Afghanistan, not just from the US, but from a lot of other countries, that this is one, if not the first, uh, resolution of which I'm aware, which made the mission in charge of actually uh, prioritizing and coordinating what the donors would do. And that was a lot of what they would call jawboning because you really didn't have any power over the donors. Because if we told them, you really need to put this into this humanitarian aid, and a donor didn't want to do that, it's not like we could force them. So it was a lot of diplomacy going back and forth. Uh, continue with the Office of High Commissioner of Human Rights to coordinate efforts to ensure protection of civilians. The, as you heard, uh, the Office of High Commissioner of Human Rights is in Geneva, and therefore their people in the mission would wear two hats. They would report to Geneva 
they would also report to the SRSG. Uh, I work very closely with uh, Danielle Bell. She's a Canadian citizen. She was director of human rights. I was director of rule of law. How do we work together? Because human rights, as you heard, and I agree completely, uh, one function is an alarm bell or reporting or criticism of what the government does. Well, we worked with the justice system, for example. We worked with corrections. We tried to build their capacity and build their support. So we would make a point, as did Danielle, of explaining we each had different roles. So while UNAMA Human Rights would have access to, for example, all the detention facilities and other areas, we, rule of law, would be working with the government, with the Ministry of Justice, with the prosecutors, with the judges, to try to build their capacity, and therefore we have different complementary functions. Obviously, if you're a human rights officer and you're writing a report that criticizes the detention and the torture, then they're not gonna really wanna listen to you if you also try to build their capacity because they're a little hurt if you criticize them. So we would work very carefully with our human rights colleagues. They had us take the lead, for example, on a new law for torture, to prevent torture. And unfortunately, in Afghanistan, it didn't work very well. There's only been five prosecutions for torture, even though the excellent reports that you can read on the website uh, showed that they had instead something like 30% of all prisoners were tortured. So obviously prosecutions were not happening. Um, also, the UN Security Council resolution said that we were to coordinate, cooperate with NATO. That NATO in Afghanistan were the military peacekeepers. And I'm sorry to say, for the first time this year, the American air power and NATO, along with the Afghan government that this government supports, killed more innocent civilians than did the Taliban with their IEDs and other bombs because basically of the air support and bombing things like Kunduz in 2016, which we believe was a war crime, but we have yet to hear what the US government's gonna do about that. Uh, perhaps we should edit that out, I don't want, the NSA, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, <laughs> I gotta speed it up here. Let me go to how the mission works. There are a lot of different models, but I think one of the main models now is you have two deputy SRSGs. The uh, one deputy SRSG deals with uh, political. We had uh, a woman who was a Danish diplomat who was the political deputy SRSG. She dealt with the peace process and the electoral process. Then we had a UK citizen. He was uh, my boss, deputy SRSG two, humanitarian and development. And that person has four hats. I've just found out that I can't go through the hats because I've got to get through these slides. Two more. Uh, budget peacekeeping. Mary told me about 50, million, 50 billion for the UN. The budget for peacekeeping, and not the political missions, but the peacekeeping missions, 6.5 billion, less than one half of 1% of the world's military budget. So that's not a lot. And it doesn't include the DPPA missions. USA pays 28%, China 15, Japan 9, Germany 6, and we have other countries who are doing a little less. The General Assembly sets that up in terms of their formula. Uh, last, uh, I will go through the history of peacekeeping in 45 seconds. So we had a modest start in 1948 with only two uh, peacekeeping efforts. One was the UNTSO, which supervised uh, what was going on after the Israeli Arab War 19, uh, before 1948, it was set up in 1948. Second, the India-Pakistan military observers uh, that have been going on and that continues since 1949. There have been 70 peacekeeping operations since 1949. Uh, 
fatalities over 3,000 UN staff, including um, some of my friends that I knew uh, in Afghanistan, uh, have been killed over 3,000 UN peacekeepers. Uh, and also, while peacekeeping started primarily as a military only, we now have what is called multi-dimensional missions that include governance, political advisors, police officers that advise lawyers, judges, attorneys, human rights monitors and experts, electoral observers, and economists. Uh, last, in 1999, the UN was very, very ambitious. And in two places, Kosovo and uh, East Timor, now called Timor-Leste, uh, the UN became the government. And that was the two times the UN had what is called an executive mandate or an executive mission. The SRSG was the chief executive of the country or of the territory or area. The SRSG was also the legislature. He or she would promulgate laws just by signing a piece of paper. And the UN in both places, uh, we were not the only judges and prosecutors. We worked as hybrid courts or hybrid chambers along with uh, the lawyers and judges who were there. That is not going to be repeated because that type of ambition showed two things. Number one, it showed that the UN is no better or no worse than a lot of other governments, and I will not go here over illegal things that the UN did as part of that government, including violating its own human rights standards. And second of all, uh, because it was just too expensive, and the UN realized that the member states do not want to give up their sovereignty. And therefore, it's not going to happen anymore. Uh, so the UN will continue doing what it is doing, which is the best we can in the field. And when you read about things, that sound terrible, or sound like the UN isn't doing what it could do. Remember one thing, the UN does not have its own army or military. It relies upon the member states. The UN has to rely upon the member states for security and protection. And because of that, a lot of things that happen in missions that are really bad happen because there was insufficient support by the member states for that security. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this introduction. And I thank UNA for having invited me here today. People might wonder, why is it that we have in the program an economist? And why I been asked to, to look into the UN and economics? First of all, just to make a link to the previous speakers, it's impossible to implement human rights without investing in so many things. For example, in civil and political rights, many people in developing countries don't have transport to go and vote. So if there are no investments in transport, it is impossible to really exercise those rights. Obviously, economic and social and cultural rights, like the right to water, the right to housing, the right to education, which I participated in the UN, for many years in the formation of those rights and debate in Geneva about these rights. Actually, I spent nine years attending the Commission of Human Rights, and I made a contribution to the right to develop it. And uh, I was very fortunate that the UN allowed me to make that contribution. Also, I think it's very important that many people think that the UN does not have much with economics, and actually that's wrong. I think the UN has a lot to do with what's happening in the economic field. Some people think, well, only the specialized agencies, like the, the World Bank, IMF, but that's not true. And what I will try to do today is really to project how the UN actually has thought about economics for, for, for from the beginning, and how different it is from other legends and how important this difference is. I'd like also to say that I was the, the key note 
poster of the position of the commission, the ECLAC, the Economic Commission for Latin America, for the 92 conference in Rio. So I had a lot of interactions with the UN system in, in addition to what Mary just uh, presented today. What is interesting to me is that looking at the, the original chapter of the UN, even in the general provision, there are a lot of statements that involve thinking about economics, prosperity, peace and security, cooperating in matters of economics, of health, and other uh, dimensions. This has to be put in context because one of the key concerns was the destruction of Europe, you know, the devastation of Europe. So the Marshall Plan and the need. So economic was always involved in thinking about prosperity and cooperation among all the countries that founded the UN. Even in the General Assembly, when the charter, original charter, talks about the General Assembly, it says very explicitly that one of the powers of the General Assembly is to call for studies, to call for resolutions that have to do with economic prosperity, with economic well-being of the countries. Even in the text of the Trusteeship Council, there is a part there that is very interesting to me because I would like in the future to use the concept of a trust territories to include other things in the United Nations that are outside today. But even in the Trusteeship Council, it says that there is an obligation of all countries to report on the economic and social welfare of the territories. So the UN was always really involved from the very beginning in thinking about that. In addition to that, there is a special chapter in the chapter that is called you know, International Economic and Social Cooperation, uh, and where the UN is very specific as to what it means by that. One is the creation of the conditions for full employment. Another one is to make sure that we have high standards of living not only in the material sense, but also on the non-material sense. And this is important also in terms of how the specialized agencies cooperate among them. Being in Geneva with WHO, ILO, and all the agencies, including you know, UNHCR and other agencies, we had many, many meetings, many, many opportunities to debate what about the economics? What about the financing? What about the investment? What about the policies that are needed to make this happen? So I think what is important as a first message to you is to say that the way the UN thinks about economics is very different from the other agencies. So for me, having been in both camps, it's sort of interesting to see how peace, security, you know, uh, human rights, stability, and economic itself, they are all part of this dialogue that takes place in the UN system that it does not take place in the specialized agencies. And so, as you will see, this is not just traditional economics. It's social economic, it's human economics, you know, it involves many other factors. And this is the real contribution of the UN to change the system you know, uh, in economics and in social value. Now, I was asked to talk about two specific points. One is the NDP, and one is the Sustainable Development Goals. I worked a lot with UNDP, actually. And uh, UNDP was uh, founded in 1966. Uh, the UN had two programs before, one on technical assistance and one on financing. The one on technical assistance was founded in 1948 and the other one in 1958. And they merged this program to create UNDP. And it was uh, very fundamental for UNDP. Many objectives that are not necessarily in the same way in other agencies, like reducing poverty, inclusion, governance, protecting the environment, energy, creating jobs, and so on. Actually, one of the the documents that present UNDP and invest, in my view, is the Human Development Report. You know, it's a very unique report from the very, very beginning. And, and it really shifts the debate, not only to the material economics, but to people. And this change from just matter to people is the 
real trademark of UNDP in its development. You know, this, this, the next uh, UNDP Human Development Report will be about inequalities, you know, and there is a theme for this, this year. But also, there are other topics. Actually, we are discussing in the last few weeks <coughs> the climate change, the summit on climate change. Actually, UNDP wrote about climate change in 2008. You know, so the topic of environmental sustainable development has been really ingrained in UNDP for many, many years back. Also, I think it's important that we recognize that UNDP today has location in country, 170 countries. Most of the specialized agencies do not have that infrastructure which gives you and me a first-hand experience of what's happening in communities, in governments, in municipalities, and in the region. Not just landing with a mission, you know, to do a project, but living there and trying to coordinate all the agencies, national as well as international. UNDP has leveraged billions and billions of dollars to help the poor, to help people to access financing, to help people to access healthcare, to help people to access information, to access many, many other things that are part of economic development. I would like to say that it is very important that the future of the world not be based simply on market economics. This is something we need to change. And I think the UN is really positioned to shift the understanding of what economics should be in the future. I don't think it will be the specialized agencies alone or the, in themselves capable to make this great shift that we need now as the global economy weakens, you know, every other day. With regard to the, the SDGs, I like to put something into context because uh, when Mary said you, you are the first environmental economist of the World Bank, I was lucky because of the World Conference on Development and Environment in Stockholm in 1972. And it was that conference that pushed many American universities, you know, to create this PhD between agriculture, economics, biology, <coughs> ecology, and many other science, and put together this particular PhD. And I was lucky to be at the University of Wisconsin and really get this particular uh, program. Actually, I didn't know what I was going to do with it at the time. Because people would say, what is this? What are you talking about? What is this environment? And this 1973-1974 is not, you know, 100 years ago. Also, I think we need to recognize Rio 92 and Rio Plus 20, you know, three big conferences, 72 in Stockholm and two in Rio. They, there is a plethora of documents, there is a plethora of agreements that form the basis for the sustainable development world. I left the UN system in this interaction as a special representative after the Millennium Development Goals. You know, and I, and I thought, well, what might come next? And I think for me it was a gift that the UN said no. You know, the way to see the world is not just through economics, it's not just through technology, it's the human factor and nature, and provide the world with 17 development goals, sustainable development goals. You know, I don't have the time to really explain each of these sustainable development goals, but for the people here who are not aware of this, you know, it includes issues like eradicating poverty, eliminating hunger, having clean cities, having good health, you know, having decent work, having a, a new way of dealing with corporate industrialization, you know, cooperation among all the agents involved, and many, many other in the list of this. I have been involved, of course, mostly in the areas of water, sanitation, environment, in terms of energy, clean energy, and all the issues that have to do with my specialty. And UNDP is playing a critical role because the sustainable development goals are not independent of each other. So somebody has to connect the dots. Somebody has to really understand that gender equality goes with economic development. So there is a fundamental question. What economics we want to have? Economics that supports rights, economics that support the human factor, 
economics that support gender equality, economics that really is more part of the people than it is in the past. This is a major challenge. The second challenge is that we are operating now in a very difficult political system. And I say this because I was a candidate to the presidency of Chile. So I am involved in politics today. You know? And the issue is, what sort of leadership is going to happen to make our conversation planetary? You know, not only country by country. Because the, the UN, the, the countries playing their own interest. You know, it's not like someone has a planetary vision and everyone is going into this planetary vision. The third point is the role of civil society. It's impossible now to think that the future of the world is going to come out only about governments. Because the civil society movement are showing that actually the governments are not that representative. Because people argue in the past, okay, the governments are there because they represent the people. But this is not necessarily the case. Let's have the case of Greta Thunberg. You know, she, with social media, is mobilizing a lot of people, a lot of young people, you know, to say, well, save the planet. And finally, to end, I like to say that there are many concepts and many ways of thinking that we need to put on the table, and I can put some that are in the legal field and it's not mine. I am just uh, an educated person in human rights. One of them is the issue of sovereignty. You know, the, the, the big fires in the Brazilian Amazon, you know, <coughs> raising the question as to how do we deal with boundaries? You know, the Treaty of Westphalia, you know, of nation states, uh, doesn't jive with what elephants do between South Africa and Mozambique. You know, the elephants that cross don't, don't see the lines between the countries, so people shoot them, kill them, and this is an issue. I am interested in saving the planet. I am interested in killing the planet. So this for me, the question of sovereignty, we need to discuss it. Layers of sovereignty so that we know not only Brazil is responsible for the Amazon, all of us are responsible and cooperate so the land of the world will survive. The, the next concept has to do with notion of collective action. One country is not going to save itself alone. This is impossible. So even if you have all the, the legal framework to operate as a country, you are in a concept of nations. You, know? you cannot just enter and exit treaties. You cannot enter and exit, you know, contributions to the UN. I think we need to be serious about this, you know. And the collective now is not only human beings. The collective is also the other sentient beings and nature. And we need to really promote the right of nature. You know, I remember when I was in the Commission of Human Rights, I talk about the right of future generations. And an international lawyer stood up and said, Mr. Sphere Yunus, you're not a lawyer. Future generations don't exist, so they are not subject to rights. Well, it took us a long time in the Commission of Human Rights to come with some jurisprudence, you know, to say, wait, wait a minute. Is it just that for the first time in history, humanity, the young people are receiving the planet worse than we receive? Where are the rights? So I talked in the last summit in New York about intergenerational rights, about climate justice, you know, because this needs to be brought to the, the future debate. We cannot keep us in silos, in a structure that actually are outside the need to help the youth and have a different future. Thank you very much.